and welcome to the Penguin Prof channel. In today's episode, I want to introduce you to some directional terms and planes of section that we're going to be using uh, in the study of human anatomy. Um, first of all, I need to describe the anatomical position, the point of reference that we're going to be using, and uh, then I'm going to give you a lot of examples of different terms that we use to describe body regions and how we sort of slice and dice uh, images uh, so we can better understand where things are. Speaking of where things are, uh, anatomy is not very different from uh, traveling. Um, so you want to kind of approach anatomy like, like you approach a, any kind of journey. Um, as many of you know, Flops the penguin loves to travel. And when you travel, just like when you study anatomy, you need three things. Uh, the first thing you need is a current and correct map. The next thing that you're going to need is a point of reference so that when you get uh, directions or when you when you look at the map, uh, things actually make sense. You have to know where you are, in other words. And the third thing is you need a common language, right, in order to be able to read the map or understand people uh, if you ask for help. Anatomy is exactly the same. We're going to need a correct and a current map. This will come from your textbook, anatomy atlases, tons of resources. You're going to have to have a point of reference. Um, you have to know where you are. You have to be able to use uh, understanding of anatomical position. You have to know where you are in order for the terms to make sense. And you need to speak the language of anatomy, right? We all have to speak the same language. Um, you know, you're going to find yourself in situations like this. You're going to be looking at us. This is actually a section through the human body, and you may have absolutely no idea what this is. Uh, where are you? You know, we're going to need these terms in order to describe what you're looking at so you can understand uh, what you're seeing. The language itself, the language of anatomy, is based in Latin and Greek. Most of the terms are actually descriptive, um, even though they can be kind of long. Uh, and then, of course, we also have eponyms, which are words that are named in honor of people, and those you just kind of have to memorize. I do have a couple of other videos that you might want to look at, how to study anatomy and uh, medical terminology, and those will help you as you uh, dive into the study of anatomy. But today's video is about position and directional terms. So first of all, our point of reference is what we call the anatomical position. In anatomical position, we have the patient, the subject, standing uh, erect. This can also be, um, in the case of a cadaver, for example, they're not going to be standing, obviously, but they will be lying on their back uh, with their belly side facing up and in this same position where the palms are facing up or are facing forward, the thumbs are facing out to the side. That is the anatomical position. The eyes are facing forward and the feet are parallel to each other. Um, this is a really good time to mention, by the way, right from left, because believe it or not, this can be very confusing. It is the subject's right or left, or the patient's right or left, not the observer that matters. So for example, when we divide the body into four quadrants, you're looking at, for example, the upper right and the upper left quadrant of the subject, not you. So I can't tell you how many times students will miss points because I will say on an exam, you know, identify, for example, right or left if I'm asking about chambers of the heart, and they miss the right or left. And they complain because how come I didn't get any credit? Well, you misidentified it. Um, if you have a hard time with right and left on yourself, um, this is just a little tip, if you face your palms away from you, uh, the left hand makes a little L right there. So that's kind of a helpful extra little tip. But um, like I said, you really need this because if you're looking at, at scans, this is an intravenous pilogram. We use it to look at uh, the renal system. But you notice this little identifier here. So the technician has to place this uh, when the patient is getting the scan uh, so that we can very easily see which side is right or left. And you know, this becomes really essential because people do make mistakes. And if you misidentify right from left, uh, you could leave your patient with one diseased kidney instead of one healthy one. So that's why we're really uh, serious about learning uh, right from left. Um, and it does take a little while to get used to. Okay, so some directional terms that we're going to be using, superior and inferior. We also use cranial and caudal, but I'm going to mention that in just a second. Superior means towards the head or towards the upper part of a structure. Inferior means low, right? So to away from the head or towards a, a lower part. And you probably know these terms anyway. If you feel superior, right? You feel above everybody else. If you're feeling a little inferior, maybe your self-esteem is not so great, um, right? So those are sort of terms in common use. 
So I have some examples for all of these terms. So the lungs are superior to the liver, right? So they are above the liver. Um, on the other hand, the small intestines are inferior to the stomach. Okay, so that's how we would use those. Um, anterior and posterior can actually refer to the entire body. So for example, in anatomical position, you see the front of the body or the anterior part of the body, the other side being the posterior. But often we're talking about, um, from a side view, for example, things that are towards the front of the body or towards the back of the body. We also use the terms dorsal and ventral, but I'm gonna get back to those in just a second, just like the uh, cranial and caudal here. So anterior is towards the front, posterior is towards the back or behind. So how we might use that as an example, the ribs are anterior to, they are in front of the spine. The occipital bone, the bone at the back of the head, is posterior to the frontal bone, right? The forehead at the front of the head. Um, the other terms that I mentioned, the dorsal, ventral, cranial, caudal, we use those a lot more often in non-human animals, specifically in quadrupeds, because the terms there make a lot more sense. Uh, you will see them in humans, but with quadrupeds, they're a lot more common. You see, you know, with other animals, you're gonna use these terms differently. Most of you probably know the dorsal fin on a fish. Uh, dorsal and ventral is color-coded in penguins. I always find that, I don't know, really handy. Anyway, um, lateral and medial. Uh, you notice a lot of these words occur in pairs. So if you draw a line midway down the body, or what we call the midline, when you move away from the midline, we call that lateral. So you're moving out to the side. When you move toward the midline, we call that medial. You're moving toward the midline. Examples of how we use this, uh, the lungs are lateral to the heart. The trachea is medial to actually both clavicles. So the trachea, your windpipe, is medial to, it's actually right on that midline, it is medial to the clavicles or your collarbone. Intermediate means between. So for example, the clavicle or the collarbone is between, it is intermediate between the uh, acromion process of the scapula, that's kind of the bony part that sticks out, and the sternum or the breastbone, the upper part of the breastbone called the manubrium. So the clavicle lies between those two structures. So you'll see that term quite a bit. Proximal and distal, um, again, you're probably familiar with the roots of these words. Proximal means close to and distal means far from. And we're always talking about the trunk of the body unless otherwise indicated. So for example, the scapula is proximal to the humerus. So the scapula or the shoulder blade is closer to the trunk of the body than the humerus. Um, the wrist, or the bones of the wrist, which we call the carpals, they are distal to the elbow. That means that these bones, the wrist bones, are farther from the trunk of the body, in anatomical position of course, than is the elbow. So we use proximal and distal quite a bit. Superficial or external, deep or internal. So you can pick and choose which terms that you like. You're going to see both of them in very, very common use. Superficial or external means toward the body surface. Deep or internal obviously means deep or away from the body surface. We use these a lot when you're talking about layers of things. So for example, here's a layer through the skin. The epidermis is superficial to the dermis, meaning it is external to, it is closer to the outside. The hypodermis, where you see that layer of subcutaneous fat, that's called the hypodermis. Hypo actually means below. That is deep to the dermis. And then terms like uh, hypodermic needles, right? Makes sense. Those are needles that are injected into the hypodermis. Contralateral and ipsilateral refer to the, the sidedness of things. Contra means against. So contralateral meaning on opposite sides. Ipsy comes from a Latin root that means the same. So for example, your right and left arms or wings, depending if you're a penguin or not, are contralateral. But your right arm or wing and your right foot 
those are ipsilateral. Those are on the same side. And you might think, well, you know, this is pretty obvious. Why would you need a term for that? This is going to be really helpful when we start talking about different skeletal muscles. Many of them that occur in pairs, they can either contract together and they cause one type of action or they can contract, you know, only one side or the other. So it, these terms actually will be very useful, but we don't need to normally refer to the arms and legs. It's pretty obvious, I think. Okay, and a couple of notes here on planes of section and how we slice and dice things up. So here's a little pop quiz for you. What are these? What are those? Well, it's kind of a trick question because they're actually two images of the same thing. Why do they look so different though? Right? This is a question that my students have all the time, especially when we jump into histology. They look so different. The reason is they're cut in different planes. So we have different planes of section. You see the cross section on one side and the longitudinal section on the other. We're gonna explain those in just a second. But let me give you an example of what I mean by it's the same thing. Here's another little pop quiz. What are these? Okay, hopefully this is not much of a quiz and you, you recognize this, but it's exactly the same answer. It's a cucumber, but it's a cucumber in two different sections. Okay, now you get it, right? So one different style of slicing we call a cross section, and what you're left with is a cucumber that's round. The other side, when you cut it lengthwise, you have a longitudinal section and you have a long skinny piece of cucumber. Now, because you have experienced lots of cucumbers in your life, it doesn't matter how I cut it, you know what it is. But in histology and in anatomy, you just haven't seen enough of this stuff, so you don't yet recognize it. So these are the different planes of sections. We have the coronal or frontal section. The coronal or frontal plane can actually divide into the anterior and posterior side. We have a sagittal or longitudinal plane. That's a lengthwise slice. If you cut right down the midline, we call that a mid-sagittal slice or mid-sagittal plane. And then we have the transverse or the cross section. And that's going to be uh, how you cut a cucumber into little circles. Uh, just to give you three really quick examples, right through the brain, we're going to look at the three different planes of sections that I just mentioned so that you can see that, of course, you're looking at a human brain. These are all MRI scans of the same thing, the same structure, but notice they look dramatically different. And that's because when you change the way that you look at something, you're going to see dramatically different structures and you're going to use different types of imaging to see different things. But it is a really challenging part of anatomy, especially when you get into cross-sectional anatomy. It's difficult to know sometimes where you are. Um, some tips that I have on this, you really just need to look at as many different references as possible. Look from as many angles at the same thing so you start to see the patterns. The other thing is you want to read the captions. The captions of every image will tell you what is the plane of section. How was that image made? You need to know that in order to know what you're looking at. So because I'm going to get a lot of questions on this, I, that image I showed you in the beginning, now you can see the anterior and the posterior. Uh, what I had labeled there, that is the aorta. That's the biggest artery of the body where blood leaves the heart for systemic circulation. As always, I hope that this was helpful. Thank you so much for visiting the Penguin Prof channel. Please click like, share, and subscribe. You can visit on Facebook and follow on Twitter. Good luck.